It's a marvelous wonder to be able to walk in a grocery store and have whatever you want when you want it. Most consumers, I don't think, understand where their food comes from and what it takes to put a head of lettuce on the table. This lettuce doesn't just show up in your grocery store. That head of lettuce from the months of November through April came from Yuma, Arizona. And there are so many hard things we have to do to get that head of lettuce ready and get it back to those folks. The Colorado River is over allocated. There's gonna be water cutbacks. If you cut water from Yuma, society will be giving up more than if you look for cuts elsewhere. Over the last 140 years, generations of farmers have built the most efficient and productive agricultural ecosystem right here in Yuma, Arizona. What we do here cannot be done elsewhere. It's super important now more than ever to keep food affordable. We need the opportunity to be able to continue to have access to Colorado River water for farming. The Yuma area to become what they've become in leafy greens to supply North America has been a long-term process. That started way back in the 1920s when people like my grandparents came here. My family came here in 1925 from California, heard about this area, that there was opportunity, and they came across the Yuma sand dunes in an old Model T truck with two mules on the back and my two-year-old father. They'd purchased 160 acres of farmland. They got here to find out that that farmland was covered in mesquite trees and all kinds of different brush. He used those mules as he brushed and cleared land an acre at a time. I can only imagine the grit and determination that people in those days must have had when they came to this place. The Yuma area was very attractive to farmers because the Colorado River ran right through it. They knew it would be great soil to grow productive crops on. When President Roosevelt was in office, he really saw the potential that the Desert Southwest area had. He formed the Bureau of Reclamation. In the early 1900s, before Arizona was even a state, they were tasked to create the Yuma Project and the Gila Project. The whole thing consumes all the irrigation districts in Yuma County, which there are six of now, and one across the river in Bard, California. The Yuma Project was the construction of the Laguna Dam and a large siphon that eventually took the water from the river to the lower land in the Yuma Valley. The Gila Project built a series of dams and canals to bring the water to what is now this vast agricultural region. My grandfather made many trips to Washington, D.C., lobbying Congress to try to get our area, the Welton Mohawk Project, included in the Gila Project. He was determined to bring water to the Yuma area. Over the span of seven years, a lot of hard work, a labor of love, they were able to bring the Colorado River water to the farmers. Once they did that, they were able to chase their goals of making alfalfa and cotton and wheat, fiber and food that people needed. And it's progressed as time has gone along until the area now is looked at as a primary food source for the continent of North America. I am a fifth generation farmer. My family moved to this region during the Dust Bowl. My family's been farming in this valley almost a century. Each generation has approved upon what the prior generation did, both in the land that we had to farm and the technology that we had, the types of crops that we grew. To try to produce the quantity of vegetables that 300 to 400 million people need, you really need a place like here in Yuma that can produce large volumes affordably, efficiently and safely and reliably. Yuma is known as the world's winter salad bowl. Close to 90% of all the leafy greens for all of North America are grown here between Thanksgiving and Easter. What happens here cannot happen anywhere else. We have things that are unique to Yuma. Our soils, our water, our labor force, the climate here, and the infrastructure that we've built cannot be found anywhere else. The agriculture economy in Yuma is about three and a half billion dollars. To get another sense of how important 
ag is in Yuma and how important Yuma is for ag in the United States, a way I like to think about it is Yuma is to ag what Detroit is to cars and what Silicon Valley is to computers. The way water rights are allocated in the West, it's based on prior appropriation. Yuma has fairly senior water rights. Historically, growers have been very nervous in Yuma with people wanting to change the nature of the deal. There was the famous bank robber. They asked him why he robbed banks. He said, that's where the money is. Ag is where the water is. So when water gets scarce, that's where people look. Everything we do from ground prep to harvest is in the best efforts of conserving as much water as we can. Over the last 30 years or so, Yuma is growing twice as much crop with 18% less water. The technology that's been developed over the years and the varieties and the specialty seeds that have been developed has a huge impact. One way to look at efficiency of water use is how much you produce per acre foot of water used. That's been called crop per drop. It's like how many dollars of output do you get per acre foot of water? It cost us $10,000 to produce one acre of vegetables ready to be shipped. And to produce that acre crop, we use two acre foot of water. If you think about it in terms of crop per drop, it cost us $5,000 per acre foot of water. In terms of dollar per acre foot of water, Yuma is about 75% more efficient than the rest of the Colorado Basin. Because of the weather conditions that we have in Yuma, we actually have two seasons in which we could produce. After we finish our vegetable crop, we come in with a second crop. When we have a flat crop, we are able to leach the salts so that whenever we come back with the vegetable crop, those vegetables will not have a problem with the salt. We are able to produce about 120 different crops in this area. Yuma is doing a lot of things to use their water very, very efficiently. The growers in the Yuma growing area have been very aggressive over the years and seeking out anything that we can find that makes us more efficient and conserves. And some of those most important technologies were back in the 70s when the laser leveling first appeared. Every field is dead level. So they go in every year with GPS or laser equipment. So there's no runoff. So water's put on and then it just soaks into the ground. What was so important about that is that a lot of our soils tend to get salty. But if you had a high place out there, it became a salty place. And produce crops do not grow in salty ground. The salty places that we used to have in those fields are not there, so they're growing crop. Every time we irrigate a field, all the water that's sent to that field ends in that field. We just use the amount of water that is necessary for that field. We don't have any tail water, and that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Some of the ways that we're very efficient with our water use is being intentional about when and where we use it and how we apply it to the crops. When people first started growing lettuce here in the Yuma area, they germinate the crop by planting seeds on the bed top and then filling up the furrows with water. It was an efficient way to establish the crop, but the lettuce seed didn't germinate all that uniformly. Plus it used a lot of water. You'd use around an acre foot of water, which is like taking a football field and filling it up with water one foot deep. Today we germinate everything with sprinkler pipe by hand moving this pipe into the field, setting it up, running it with a pump, and we use dramatically less water. When we're done establishing our crops, we'll move on to furrow irrigation. This is a soil probe. Farmers are utilizing new tools and technologies like this to make more timely and efficient irrigation decisions. There's a sensor placed every two inches. This telemetry box sends a cellular signal to the grower's interface. That way you know, hey, it's time to irrigate again. Instead of just putting your crop on a schedule and watering every 10 days, this is giving you the most accurate and precise data to time your irrigations in efforts to save water and giving the crop only what it needs. 
All farms in the Yuma area use the particular irrigation methods that work best for growing their crop and also for mitigating salt or other elemental issues that they're dealing with. Farmers have gotten extremely good at it, so much so that when you drive by on the road, it looks extremely uniform. That doesn't get that way by accident. That's through proper tillage, maintaining proper drainage, and certainly irrigating at the right times and with the right quantities of water. It's very intentional use of a precious natural resource like water. People have this idea that farming is all cows and plows, it's all backwards, but it's a really high-tech endeavor. To produce in a biological system is incredibly knowledge intensive. When you're growing a crop, you have pests, you have diseases. The growers there are very, very sophisticated. There's so much new technology always coming down. This is a very high-tech industry. They're always looking to maximize their production, and the best to do that is to integrate new technology. Now we're seeing this exponential growth and mechanization. Because of all the conditions that happen in the field, like insects and diseases, sometimes seeds don't perform. We've actually had to overplant these fields and then go in with labor crews and thin out the undesired plants to leave an even spacing so that when we harvest, we have a very even harvest. There's always a way to do it better. Chemical thinners, mechanical thinners, those are amazing. It doesn't eliminate, but it reduces the need for labor. And labor's always an issue. Now with these chemical thinners, you get an efficient way of safely thinning your crop mechanically. As we irrigate a crop, we wanna make sure that we don't have other things growing out there. You'll find very few weeds here and there. It's not because weeds don't grow, but it's because we're removing them and trying to make sure that the only thing we're growing with the precious natural resources that we have are the crop we're intending to grow. So we're eliminating weeds using new laser technology. We can actually teach the software what's a weed, what's a lettuce plant. Drone technology every year gets better and better and better. And I think initially here in the desert, a lot of it was for doing stand counts so that you could better predict what your potential harvest would be at the end. Most recently, we're seeing application of pesticides, which is great where you've got this ag-urban interface where you can't necessarily put an airplane into a field. We have challenges all the time and a lot of them go unseen. We run into disease issues, pests, insects, mildew, you name it. There's things that want to destroy your food before it ever makes it to your table. And the only way that we're able to overcome those things is through science and research. The University of Arizona has a research presence here in the Yuma area. Together, we can actually solve these problems. And being local, it's like having a little field laboratory in their backyard. Growers keep track of every gallon of water they're using in Yuma. There's other parts of the West where how much water is being used isn't even measured. In Yuma, people keep incredible tabs on every drop of water they're using. We've had a lot of covariant systems. It shows you through algorithms what you should be putting on, when you should be putting on for an iceberg lettuce crop, for a romaine crop. Without the science, it'd be by guess, by golly, out on my end of the deal. I've been all over this country. I've been to Texas, I've been to Florida, I've been to several places in California, and I've never seen the level of interaction and collaboration that we have here in the desert Southwest. And I guess you just attribute that to the people. Without world-class researchers, we really couldn't produce as efficiently and productively as we can, and there's no replacement for having them right here in our backyard working hand in glove with us. We're in a desert climate, so it's dry, and that's good for vegetables. What comes with that are also microclimates. We farm in an area that's basically 90 miles wide, and we start at one end of this area, and then we move through each region. So there's all kinds of seed varieties. We plant to harvest so that we have a steady supply from the middle of November through the middle of April. We also set up trials throughout the season so that we can look at new varieties that are coming on for two or three years down the road. We like to take baby steps with a variety and test them to look and see how they'll perform in those conditions. 
As the ones that do well, we'll plant rows, we'll plant harvest passes, and then ultimately we may split fields or plant whole fields of those varieties to change a grower's program. We grow a lot of specialty items for different customers. If you're growing for a salad plant, you want tonnage. You want to get as big a head as you can so that you can get the tonnage that the processors want. We even have iceberg lettuce varieties that are bred just to go on a hamburger because the leaf size is right. They can just grab a leaf, put it on there, and you have your lettuce on your hamburger. As costs rise and growers want to be more precise, transplanting is definitely becoming more and more important to these growers. I start cauliflower with transplants. First off, the seed's really expensive to be direct seeding it. And when it's 115 degrees, it doesn't like to germinate, so you have to use a lot of water. If we do it with transplants, we don't have to use as much water. This is the nursery that we grow the transplants in before they're taken to the field. Each one of these houses is about an eighth of an acre, which equates to about 40 acres in a field. What we're looking for in these plants is a really, really good root ball that will hold up to be being transplanted. Everything that we do in a nursery facility is designed around keeping our plants healthy and keeping our plants uniform. We have to seed all of these plants. They're seeded with a machine, but then the trays have to be hand laid in these nurseries. And we're constantly looking at ways to improve the precision so that we maintain that uniformity when we go to the field and just minimizing the amount of water that you're using. Most transplanting equipment these days is automated. It still takes labor to feed the plants into the automated planter machines. We took an eighth of an acre of property with very little water and inputs and converted it into this 40 acre field. We're not even to lunchtime and you can see they've covered a lot of ground. It's very efficient. The sprinkler system is ready to go as soon as they get the plants in. The uniformity starts at the seed and goes all the way through the planting process, the watering process, all the way up to the harvest process. It's nice to see these plants that we grow in the nursery taken care of like this. It just makes you proud that you're part of something that's helping do what we do here in Yuma, and that's feed the nation affordably and healthy and safe. In the Yuma area, we have about 180,000 acres, and at least 80% of those acres are in vegetables. In a 40-acre block, we produce six million servings of vegetables. In Yuma, they produce about one billion pounds of lettuce a month. That comes out to about 170 million servings a day. You think about harvesting all that product. One acre can give you a thousand boxes. In a thousand boxes, you got 24 heads. So that's 24,000 heads an acre. And the nation consumes about 450,000 boxes a day. It takes a lot of labor to feed this nation. The Growers Company was started by our father in 1950 in the Phoenix area to provide labor to the farmers. Because they were growing houses in Phoenix instead of produce, we had to make our way towards Yuma to continue our business. We provide pre-harvest labor, thinning crews and weeding crews. And then when the harvest comes, we provide the labor, the machinery, the trucking to cut, pack, close and load and transport the produce to the cooling facilities. It's very important that every single head of lettuce that we grow is safe. We do monthly inspections, monthly water sampling. Every single employee goes through training. There's a lot of accountability. We grow our product like if we're gonna eat it ourselves. We've been struggling with labor for the last 15 years. Americans just don't wanna do this work. It's skilled labor. You have to walk on uneven ground all the time, fight weather conditions, whether it's hot or cold, it's usually wet and muddy. One of the benefits that we have about Americans not wanting to do the work is our location to the Mexican border. So we have people crossing every single day it's got to be legal laborers that walk back and forth. There is a lot going on that people don't realize. They just go to the grocery store and see this bag. They have no idea what it took to get there. 
We'll pack head lettuce many different ways. We're gonna pack a box of 24s. You gotta select the head, he's gotta cut it. He takes the leaves off, make sure it's clean, puts it in a bag. A packer will tighten the bag, tape it, and then pack it in a box. And that just goes on head by head, head by head, and each machine will have 11 cutters, 11 packers. Romaine hearts the same way, but that one's you gotta take excess leaves off the romaine, then this one gets put in the back and it gets sealed. Per year to produce on farm leafy greens takes 17 million hours of labor just on the farm. That's not the logistics of getting it from the farm to your table. It's an enormous endeavor. 2,500 trucks coming into our area a day to pick up produce to take it all the way through the rest of the country. There's vertical integration all the way from the production of the crop into shipping. So they have this huge, sophisticated system of logistics to get things from Yuma, like one tiny county in Arizona to all of North America. Go to a grocery store in Toronto, Trent, New Jersey, Asheville, North Carolina, Chicago, Billings, Montana. It's all gonna be from Yuma. When we're young, our moms tell us how essential vegetables are for our health. When we get older, our doctors tell us that. The reality is these vegetables are super important for our diets. We find ourselves in this area with all of these good assets to grow all these crops and supply North America with safe, secure produce, guaranteed supply and guaranteed quality. The fight that we're fighting today to maintain our water is probably the most important fight we've ever fought. All the generations before us, they had to be passionate about the opportunity that they saw in this area. Here we are 100 years later and that passion is still there. I see our farmers here being innovative, looking to the future, making adjustments to preserve this area. Yuma will be fine as long as we have the water to grow. 60, 70 years ago, we started down a track with Colorado River allocations heading in the wrong direction. Bad public policy, some bad decisions uh, over allocated the river. And so as you might imagine, it's gonna be good leadership and good direction that gets us out of it so that the next 100 years of Americans can benefit from amazing winter vegetable production here in Yuma. Our nation's food security is national security. And right now there's 35 million Americans that face insecurity every day. One third of our population that is obese. And here we grow the safest, healthiest food available. But we won't be able to do that without water. This is food, this is medicine. We have learned a lot of lessons about supply chain. This is the one place that we can protect our food supply and keep our citizens of this country healthy. Why mess with it? Let's protect it.